Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. I have a show today that I've been waiting for for a number of weeks. It's very fascinating. I mean, it's right up my alley. My wife and I, Kristen, as you know from watching the show, we're very interested in public safety. We think it's a very important area, a very important space. For the people that watch the show, you know how important we feel it is to really have safety, to have a safe street, to have something in your community that really is a beautiful thing that you can walk around, drive around, engage in your daily activities and feel safe in doing so. And of course, one of those components is public safety and the way in which it's administered through various through various processes and various organizations within a particular city, a county or a state. And we've been able to invite a real expert on the show today in public safety. He, of course, is the CEO of the National Public Safety Group. And we love what Mr. Buck Mims is doing with his team so much. We wanted to invite him on the show. We actually cut out some extra time today for him as well, because it's such a fascinating space. But before we get started, Buck, welcome to the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it's an honor to have you on the show. We had a pre-interview meetup and some of the things you were sharing with me and some of the engagement that you've done within the communities that you serve are really remarkable, really taking a passionate approach with your team. And by the way, the team at National Public Safety Group is remarkable, making sure that sort of the technology stacks and the, and the needs assessments for the various public safety agencies that you do business with are absolutely spot on. And then, of course, putting a selection process in place to make sure they get the best of the best, the world-class components to make and effectuate the needs assessment at the highest level, and then managing the project all along the way. But before we get started, let's pull the lens back, Buck, to 30,000 feet. Tell us about the National Public Safety Group, and then we're going to go into it. Sure. So we're a, um, a unique sort of consulting firm because we only consult for public safety agencies that includes technologies for public safety software only. So we don't do radio projects. We don't do buildings for 911 centers. We only do what's called computer-aided dispatch, called CAD, which is when you call dispatch, a lot of folks wouldn't know what happens. But when you call dispatch, it pulls up all kinds of information about your, your location, what fire station should come to your house, what police departments, things like this. Then you got your records management system where the agencies keep up with all their records on the fire side as hydrant maintenance to everything on the police side from incident reports. Your jail management software, which, of course, does get you intake into a jail. But also, if Andy and Buck fight, it won't let it, you bet us together. There's an officer and detention and inmate safety in those. Then there's mobile data, which most people kind of know what that is. You get stopped. You get your license ran and those kind of things. Large complex systems that take usually one to two years for medium-sized agencies and some are up to four and five years to implement. Yeah, Buck, it's really interesting. I want to go baseline. I want to kind of get down into it a little bit and then build it up from there. When we talk yeah. about public safety agencies for the people watching the show, because a lot of people take it for granted. You know, they wake up in the morning, they go get their coffee, they're driving around. They're not thinking about what's going on behind the scenes with public safety. When we talk about public safety, are we talking about police, fire, EMS? Talk about the agencies that are sort of covered in the umbrella of public safety. Sure. And, you know, it always starts at 911. You know, I was a police officer for many years full time, then, you know, became an auxiliary. But we think people call us for help. Nobody calls a police officer for help. They call 911. And behind that telephone, you've got a, a, a telecommunicator that every day goes to their own little PTSD because it's a stressful environment. But we have our 911 centers. Some are attached to agencies, some are standalone. You got your police departments, your sheriff's offices, you got your state agencies like state troopers, you got some like alcohol law enforcement agencies. Um, you got your jails, of course, um, and then your emergency medical services as well. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that's interesting. And of course, it's very fascinating. Okay, so let's let's break it down because things happen. But before we talk about breaking it down, about what happens with the nine one one call and what happens with the logistics and the technology and the v potentially video and everything else with the engagement. Let's talk about it because big cities, it seems like some of those big cities are a little antiquated 
And now it also seems that some of the younger, smaller cities that are growing sort of started at the beginning right, and they're able to have a maybe even a better technology platform for the big cities. What's the sort of diversification of the technology stacks between bigger, small, medium-sized cities? Yeah, and, and it's, you're, you're spot on because you would think the larger agencies, the larger cities, like your top 10 cities and top 10 counties would have the most you know, um, up to date and cutting edge technology. And it's honestly, a lot of times the furthest thing from the truth. As a smaller agency, if you're a, you know, 20 to 50 man agency, you might be able to replace your software in eight to 12 months. But we've got some very large agencies right now. And we have one, the, the project's four years is the anticipated time from starting the project to going live. And it's not the length of the project as much as public safety software like CAD, Records Mobile, Jail, is the most impactful project an agency will have. Like one of our agencies has over 4,000 users. It will touch every single user in their day-to-day -day operations. So it's a very difficult thing to forklift it out besides the technology challenges you have of when you go live, making that flip of a switch all in one instance for all those users, training 4,000 users up at that point, but also the people challenges, the change management on the people side and this industry is very difficult because people have usually usually used their system for 15 or 20 years. And we literally see it at 911 centers as a good example. CAD's so complex, and that's a highly stressful job. These people go through stress every day. And if we're at a medium to large center, typically there's usually a couple of dispatchers that may end up retiring instead of having to learn a new system. It's that stressful. Wow, it's so interesting, Buck. And of course, Anybody that watches TV or anybody that goes online, I mean, TV might even be antiquated. They're watching streaming shows. We always see shows where they always have the 911 operator talking to the potential victim or the, you know, the perpetrator, whatever it may be. You know, a lot of these 2020 type shows, Dateline type shows. And you listen to the, the, the 911 operator. And oftentimes they're just so cool under pressure, they're well-trained, but there's a lot of technology that's going behind the scenes that when you watch these shows, you don't even know what's happening. So, you know, I know there's some secret sauce out there and some things that, you know, you can't really talk about because it's so evolved and, and the tech platforms are becoming so sophisticated. But from a basic standpoint, when a 911 operator gets that call in a in an advanced project managed system. What other types of things are going on behind the scenes? Are there video, are there mapping, are there geofencing opportunities? What's going on for that public safety department to know what's happening where, maybe even who the people are and what those people have done in their past so that the law enforcement officers know what to expect when they arrive at the scene? Well, thanks for the simple question. I appreciate that. That's a very easy answer. Uh, right. that. Yeah, I'll do my best. Okay. So, um, so there is a, there's a tremendous amount that happens. And even on a benign call, because you hope for the best and you plan for the worst, a lot of these things are happening automated already in the background. There's information at a, at a telecommunicator's fingertips they may and hopefully don't have to use. But if you call in, let's say, for a structure fire, when, the, when that happens, you call in, the, it's actually what's called a 911 phone system, call premise equipment that takes a call. It takes that information, geolocates you at your house, or if you're on a cell phone through phase two wireless, or if they're using like what's called rapid SOS technology, locates you standing in a mall where you see somebody, you know, that's starting a fire or starting a shooting. That information is transposed. And that the 911 phone system is to make sure they're getting your correct location, know who the call is coming from. And it's called like an Annie Alley dump over into CAD. When CAD gets it, computer-aided dispatch is what does all the heavy lift in the background. So when that call comes in at Andy Jacobs' house, it says what fire station should be responding to that according to your location, what police department, but also which officers on that zone or beat. On top of that, as you get the call for service dispatched out, like if it's for fire, which trucks, is it an engine, is it a ladder? All these things are done through what takes a lot of time to program in the back end of the software. So if it's just a structure fire call, it might send like an engine and a tanker if it's somewhere near a hydrants. But if it's a bridge height where you have to have a ladder truck for a high rise building, it might then also have that GIS, like Esri mapping software you talked about in the background that says, we've got to actually not dispatch from fire station 21 because of the bridge height. It'll take them longer to get around. We're going to get from station 22. So it's 
calculating all this in the background, which takes a tremendous amount of work to build in. And at the same time, there's alerts, premise alerts. Maybe your house is pretty safe, but at that same structure fire, if then an alert can come up and say, this is actually a known meth house. So that could be a laboratory in here, explosive uh, explosive types of substances here. So we then know they're approached that a little bit differently. And I mean, literally I could go on and on with the premise alerts. You know, it may be somebody who's known the assault law enforcement before or firemen before or EMS personnel before. It's a tremendous amount of data happening all at the same time. And these CAT systems are built to try to simplify that coming into a telecommunicator because no matter how sharp they are, and they are trained to be very cool under pressure. You know, yeah. They can go and cry about a bad call afterwards, but they're, they typically handle it extremely well. But that's got to be giving them in a very user-friendly way so they can pick and choose what they need with a tremendous amount of data. And then at the same time, even simple things like if we run your license plate, this what's called telescoping queries, where it runs your tag, it takes the owner's name out, runs the owner through like NCIC, runs it through your local records management for local wants, warrants, and alerts. So if an officer is about to stop a car, that dispatcher can say, hey, by the way, this guy's known to carry a pistol. He said he's going to kill the next police officer that stopped him. So there's a, you're right. It's a tremendous amount of data happening through multiple systems. And all that is being recorded on recorders. There's recorders for everything that's said so that at any time a call for service happens, we can come back and we can break that down, not just to catch somebody you know who's done something wrong and you're trying to see what they did wrong. It's used for training. What could we have done better? How could we have made this a more efficient call for service? How can we change our workflows our approval processes so this goes faster because let's face it 10 seconds in a life-threatening situation is a lifetime i mean if you got a home invader to your house and somebody's breaking in 10 seconds is forever so it's those things that they use as tools to improve their processes wow so interesting buck and and it's so important we want to talk about your needs assessment how you do it and then the selection process that you use to determine which one of the partners you're going to bring in to sort of make the project work. But before we do that, an officer, they're in their car. You see them sometimes when you look in the officer's cars, they now have some big like computer screens, almost like Tesla screens. So do you also monitor social media? So is there a database where we might know that somebody is saying some things on social that potentially could be uh, a problem for an officer or a firefighter? Is that something that we're not doing yet within the system? There's a lot of agencies now that are, are absolutely monitoring social media, searching for keywords, things like this. In the cars, typically your, your, your officers, he or she is not typically doing that on the move because there's so much happening already. But especially as you get into agencies that have like real-time crime centers, they're doing, especially ones that are dealing with like, you know, child crimes where you have a lot of pedophiles that use social media to their advantage. There's a lot of searching, a lot of scanning, a lot of trying to get into chat rooms and things like that. So they can use those to find out who might be a threat before it happens. Yeah. And you mentioned these real time crime centers. I had a chance to view one and it seemed like it was a TV studio. I mean, it was incredible. It almost seemed like a like a Fort Knox of video screens and, you know, guys and gals all, you know, teched up with their wireless, you know, intercom systems and everything else. I know you can't talk about it all, but briefly tell us what that's about and how that integrates into a system. Yeah, and you know, and I'm glad you brought that up, Andy, honestly, because I think it's a large misconception of what that's used for. Um, and you know, a lot of people are so worried about privacy, you know, and, and that is 100% about a thing to be concerned about. I don't want my privacy infringed upon. I'm very, I'm very protective over my privacy. But you know, these agencies are typically number one. They're they have a full-time job that's really taxing. Number two, most agencies now are shorthanded. If you have a simple uh, one specific incident of somebody that's doing something, trying to find something they shouldn't, that typically comes up pretty quick. But these are used for public safety and officer safety. And I'll give you an example. We have a very large sheriff's office that's building out a real-time crime center. And we went and visited Las Vegas as real-time crime center and Metro PD, which is very impressive. And, and they gave us a phenomenal presentation about how it works. One of the videos is an example was a homeless lady that was just propped up in the door, kind of the, um, in a garage, a shut garage, kind of in the corner. And a guy came up and started trying to sexually assault her. And one of the real-time crime center operators actually caught that on camera when the call came in, saw the guy, 
And when he started running, because they have a lot of cameras in Vegas, they followed him block to block, ended up catching him. That's the value of a real-time crime center. And of course, I don't want anybody filming my house all day, but if something happens and the police can look at my house on the outside, not inside, that's different, and can have situational awareness to see if there's somebody in my backyard. In my, I mean, these are life-saving things that gets a perpetrator off the street that if you let them go because of that, your family may, may be next because they don't they don't have any prejudice in who they assault. Yeah, I'm all about that. And of course, for the officers and the firefighters and the EMS units, those people that work in those jobs, they have enough stress, let alone the additional stress of not knowing. And I think if I was in one of those jobs, I'd want to know what I'm walking into. It gives me sort of a strategic advantage. Even if I'm taking someone to the local jail, I want to know what that person's done in the past. Have they ever acted up in the jail? Have they ever assaulted a police officer when they're being taken out of the patrol car? And that type of information is available, right? Correct. And there's a couple of technology, few technologies out here that come to mind immediately. One is Higher Ground, which has a product called Live 911, which actually streams the 911 call directly to the patrol, not just dispatch, but the patrol car. So, you know, Andy and Buck are on the way to a bad call for service where a guy's been reported to have a gun at a picnic area with a bunch of kids playing. So we're going lights and siren. This is dangerous. This is going to be an active shooter. You know, it, it changes your level of, of, of alert, your alert level pretty high. But all of a sudden you're listening to the caller. They say, well, what is he carrying in his hand? Did you see the gun? And you hear him say, well, I'm not sure it's a gun. All of a sudden we kind of tone down. Okay. Maybe it's not. So it's not that you don't respond as quickly but there's been so many instances with Live 911 that actually have saved people from being in a very high stress situation facing the police, which are like thinking you're doing something dangerous, where it wasn't any, anything at all. It was benign. And then Carbine and a company called Prepared Live actually has it where you can do live video streaming the 911 from your phone. So this has been tremendously life saving people out on the water that's been stranded and all of a sudden they can't, they can't, there's no mom marker, but you got somebody in the water that's trying to tread water. There's a broke down boat and they can actually show around them what they can see. Like they can see the the coastline of New York city or a mountain and the, and the, and the dispatchers can then figure out where you are. These things are incredibly great public safety tools that are now becoming much more prevalent in our society. Yeah. I love it. And you mentioned, let's stay with the story of, you know, the perpetrator and the police, we have so many other things to speak about, but sure. they, the police oftentimes have a body camera. Is there some yes. technology integration between the camera coming on and some, some asset or some action step that occurs with the police officer that those cameras come on automatically? Yeah, it could be multiple. And it's according to the technology you buy, which vendor, and also what they're in- integrated with. Because one of the misconceptions as you and I talked about before we ever get to this actual interview is how most of these companies aren't just, you know, interface together, but there's technology where you can, and there are a few companies that have some of this technology automated automatically built in because they own both all sides of the software and the video. But there's technology now where when you get into a situation, like if you pull your weapon out of your holster, your own body video comes on, it can start streaming it live automatically to dispatch. If you fire your weapon, it can happen. It's multiple triggers that can happen with this. In your car, when you turn your lights on, and this has been going on for years, it can automatically start your camera systems as well. Wow. So there's multiple triggers like that that can, and there's even systems where if you hit your like panic button, like on a Motorola radio, which has the Motorola on body video, it will automatically, it can automatically turn on all the cameras in like a 30 foot radius of you of any other officer. So all cameras come on automatically versus we're in a very tense, situation, stand off with a gunman. I don't have to reach up and turn anything on. It does it automatically. Tremendous life-saving tool. Wow. It's life-saving and it's amazing the technology behind it. And of course, agencies from all around the country reach out to you and they say, Buck, you know, we've heard what you're doing. The first step it appears to us here at .com Magazine is you and your team. And by the way, I want to mention the team again, I mean, these are people that have actually been on the ground. These are people that are not just tech people. They understand the needs of safety, whether they're ex-police officers, ex-firefighters, ex-911 people. 
ex safety experts. I mean, you've brought together the best of the best. When you go in, you do a needs assessment. Uh, I would imagine it could be quite quite intricate. I mean, depending on how big of an agency, how long does that take for a, a regular needs assessment? So you can go back and say, hey, man, you know, we've got these tools, we've got this process, we can project management all the way to the end. Here's the price. How long does that needs assessment take? Usually anywhere from two to five months, according to the size of the agency, because you're right, it's very intricate. And there's the two parts of it. The part one is the scope of work, which we get, we have to literally, like if you're going out to bid to buy a new CAD records, mobile and gel system, there's several thousand specifications we have to lock down of what you specifically need for your agency. The fun part of our job is, you know, two agencies, same size, same demographics, and no two are the same at all. They work very, very differently. So there's no cookie cutters of this. And so we build out the tech specs, which is very laborious and just tedious, but also extremely important not just for a bid, but also we use that for your scope of work for your contract and make sure you're getting the right thing and you know what you're not getting. And then we also build a document to try to help streamline the project once it starts. So that's all your workflows, approval processes, interfaces and things. So our team goes in to actually build all that out. So once you do sign a contract, instead of a company then coming in from scratch and starting and saying, what do we need to do? We've already been here for months. We've got all this information. They still need to come in and confirm things and see what they need, but it really helps the project a lot. And to your point, you know, I've known most of the people on my team for many years. They're the best of the best. And that's what I was trying to do is build just a public safety software specialty team. So they also, we built a very good system. They helped create. We created it together. So it's systemized and it's not so hard on the agency because they're already overwhelmed with work and understaffed. Yeah, I love it. The selection process, of course, you do the procurement. And when I'm thinking about it, a lot of data, a lot of data is passing between different softwares, different tech stacks. And I would imagine that, you know, Buck, one thing that that you're probably very, very, you know, interested in and leading the charge with is the protection of the data. Let's talk about how important that is to the National Public Safety Group and the way in which your team approaches that. Yeah. And, and you know, Andy, that's something that right now we have an agency that just had an, a ransomware attack that took them completely down with their CAD and their 911 center, their records, and their very large agency is crippling. Um, I, um, before I started National Public Safety Group, I sold software for 15 years and I sold a 26 agency consortium with six PSAPs on one system. And the first project call we had, they had to shut it down because they had a ransomware attack and they shut the whole, they shut the whole city down. So even today, we're continuously researching cybersecurity. We're looking at investing more in that as a company. But even today, we had a call with a company called OpSWAT that does cybersecurity for public safety agencies. One of our company, our agencies now is actually using OpSWAT um, to do their cybersecurity analysis and some training um, because, you know, nobody's immune to this. And, and what's really not known about cybersecurity is most threats or most occurrences happen not because of some vulnerability in like a Trojan horse or something. It's because of a user clicking something they shouldn't click. Email not being secure. It's the people side of that that is really about educating your employees to make sure that they handle things safely. Because this is, again, very, very private. This is public safety. There's federal and state rules of how you have to protect data and information. So it's, it's key that from a cyber perspective, they're protected. Yeah, I love it, Buck. And I want to give a shout out to the public safety officials, the people that work in public safety. You you meet with them. You're on the ground floor. You have interaction with them. They're committed to doing a great job. They're, they're a group of highly trained professionals. They take great pride in their work. Let's Let's talk about that a little bit because I feel it's important to discuss that because oftentimes, again, Many people go about their day and they're not thinking about it until they really need them. But man, right. those those people working in the industry, they're they're professional, they take great care, and they really care about people. They care about their communities. How important is it when you're talking to the groups that you speak with that the conversation centers around what you can do to do good by the community? It is everything. Um our mission statement is honestly to help agencies improve officer and public safety. And, and I say this, I said this 
all my years selling software, once I got ingrained and understood really how this works, how procurement works at cities, counties, and states, I said in all my presentations today, I said to all my agencies to remind them, I said at all of our company meetings, we get caught up in the bureaucracy of having to buy technology and implement it. It's, it's complicated. It's, it's demanding. There's a lot of accountability. It, it is tremendous amount of responsibility if, if, if our chief or sheriff said, hey, Andy and Buck, you guys are in charge of replacing our $20 million software system. And we haven't done it in our career. And that's what happens. But really, everything we're trying to do, we're trying to get a first responder to a call for service faster. We're trying to make sure we have good resource allocation. Where should our officers rove? Where should we have fire stations? Where a fire station goes is immensely important. You don't just plop one down. Same with EMS stations, right? So, it, it Matt, this is a job of purpose because people don't think about the police, the firemen, the EMS folks, 911 centered, and the telecommunicators until they need them typically. And it's usually at a traumatic time in your life. They are the important asset. 100 percent they're the most important part of this and you know just honestly like i i think i told you you know before i'm still sworn as an auxiliary not that i only work a couple times a year but it keeps it very real to me when i got a strap on a gun and a bulletproof vest and that's baton you know summer had a drunk guy on the road that didn't want to move and i had to move him and it, it, it reminds me every day of how real this job is you know there was just a guy who was on the job that just got killed a few weeks ago that had been on the job for three days mm. a young guy 22 years old mm. It's real. People die. Um, we can't get to call for service fast enough and somebody gets raped or assaulted. This is as real as it gets. It doesn't get any more real. So the people that do this job, you know, I've worked with a lot of very high tech people and, and multi-billion dollar companies in my past. And there are people just as talented and more that work for a third and a fourth of the money because they, they love the purpose of helping people. And that might sound hokey to some people, but I'm telling you, the people we work with are so passionate. They're so passionate about their job. And most of them could go out and get a job somewhere else and they don't do it. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's amazing the people that come out here to help strangers be protected that they don't even know. Yeah, we love it. We love, we love the work they do. Now, we know that a lot of technology, Buck, throughout the years has been driven really through the Department of Defense into the contractors, Boeing and the like, and then they come up with great ideas. And one thing that we see happening throughout the world are drones and drone technology. And I'm fascinated with drones. I, I, I think there, there's a place for them and there, there's an important place for them. And again, I don't want you to talk about anything that you know you have clearance on or top secrets, but Will drone technology change the complexion, do you feel, in the future, or has it maybe already with regard to public safety? Yeah, it's a tremendous game changer and for very good reasons. And there's a, a lot of scrambling being done to make sure we have the right protections in place for privacy laws and things flying over people's homes and things like this. There's a lot of rules about that. Um, but I'll tell you, a good example is Chula Vista PD in California, a smaller agency, actually. They're probably one of the leading agencies that have done a lot of good work with drone technology. And I go back to the example I used earlier. There was a call they had one day where I remember reading about where there's a guy with a gun and they're responding. And then when you go to a call with a gun, you're thinking, I got to probably draw my gun. I'm just going to be a confrontation shooting. And then they sent a drone over and realized it wasn't a gun. Right. Well, not only did that de-escalate the officers, how about the rest of the people around a home? Police also show up. This guy's holding a toy gun. You got a birthday party in the back with a bunch of kids. And all of a sudden, some SWAT guys come running across the fence with real guns. The trauma that creates the fear for police officers when really they don't have a way of knowing. So these this drone technology is amazing what it can do for surveillance like this. And I think you'll see it continue to get more and more robust um, in our industry. Yeah, I think so, Buck. And I want to talk about the future. A lot of people that watch the show you know, they reach out there, Andy, you know, what's happening with the robots, what's happening with the AI in, in every vertical, of course. And right. when I grew up, when I was younger, there was a show, a TV, a, a movie called RoboCop. Now, for the, yeah, younger, very familiar. <laughs> right? for the younger people yeah. watching the show, you probably know RoboCop 2, 3, 4, 5. I, I saw the original RoboCop. Same. And 
And we think about the robots. I mean, you, you watch what's going on at MIT, you watch what's going on in the different labs throughout the world, they're incredible. In the future, are we going to see more robotics into play to help the national, you know, help the safety groups do their thing? Or you think, you know, we know it's still going to have to be human, but do you see more of that happening in the future? Yeah, I don't know. I'll be honest with you, because this is such a complicated job. This is a people business where you have to make life and death decisions, whether you're a telecommunicator, fireman, EMS person, or a police officer. Life and death decisions in a multitude of seconds or split seconds. Yeah. And there's a human factor that you can't program algorithms in for to make sure it makes a decision that doesn't harm people. So will it help with warehouse, you know, um, uh, uh, stocking and things like that? Sure. And a lot of other processes that are very complicated. I just don't know how much is going to overtake public safety because this is, and you think about the scrutinization when a police officer gets in a shooting. Can you program enough of that in? And then if you start doing that, what biases come in play? Do you want to have some social social justice factor in if it's a minority or if it's not a minority and those kind of things that, you know, how do you do that? I don't know that could happen. Um, I know right now one of the things we are getting is some automation with AI for calling in the 911, but it's not really a 911 call. If it's these types of call, it sends you somewhere else. You do see that. And I think that you'll continue to see more and more, especially the telecommunicating staff so far down right now, because we have to have something to take the pressure off. You cannot, you can't force people to come work there, but you can lower the number of 911 calls that's entered into 911 that could be going up to a 311 system. Yeah, very interesting. I agree. And of course, I already know I want to bring you back on the show. There's so much more to unpack. You spent more time with me than uh, than typically I do. But I, I, I want to thank you for doing that for me because this is a yeah. fascinating sort of subject matter for me, and I'm very fascinated with it. I want to talk about the project management piece of National Public Safety Group because, you know, you go and you do the needs assist- assessment. You bring your team, the best of the best. Then you do the selection process of what needs to go in to make this thing work. You start thinking about the way data integrates. You think about the overlaying of the of the cybersecurity. You do the procurement. All of this is happening within this project, within this project. But then it's all it all goes in. And I would imagine at that point in time, you know, the people at the at the agencies, they're looking at each other like this is the super coolest stuff that we've ever seen. But we need to learn how to use this. So I would imagine there's a project management component as well, what you do. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So when an agency, um, when they sign a contract with a vendor out here, the project, actual project starts to get it implemented. And the vendor is always going to have their own project manager and they'll have their own, what we call SMEs or subject matter experts, an SME for CAD, for records or jail, whatever has been implemented. And then the agency has their contacts, their agency lead for their the project management side, as well as the people that's on what you call a build team. And those are the people that actually are experts at using the technology for the day-to-day job. And what we tell our agencies is when we come in as consulting experts for public safety software, is we're experts in the public safety software field for helping you do a needs assessment, choosing the right vendor. We do a tremendous amount of research on them. Great. Helping you negotiate a safe contract and implementing it. We'll never be an expert at your job every day. And neither will the vendor. So you got to appoint the right people at your agency to help us and them do the job. And what we do is we actually provide our own project manager that tries to take most of the work off of the project manager for the agency. Because many times that's somebody that's actually got a full-time job already that's taking on an extra project. Or it's an IT staff that doesn't do this every day. So the expertise we offer is actually because most of us didn't just work in public safety agencies. We work for public safety software companies. So we know the language, we know the process. They don't do that every day. They're super smart, but it's just like if you tell me to, um, you know, go and do a crime scene analysis somewhere, I'm going to be lost because I don't know how to get DNA. It's no different. That's their day to day job. This is ours. And we also provide our own subject matter experts that work at companies and agencies. So we're just making sure it's building the best practice method to get the best reporting done and it's implemented the best way. And we try to take all the headaches out. There's so many things happen in these projects that are just laborious and tedious but cause problems and delays. We try to do all those on the side so the agency's not having to deal with all the heavy lifts. Yeah, I love it. I want to get into entrepreneurship with you. And again, thank you for staying over. I have one more question. Absolutely. I was sure. speaking with a, with a police officer, and he was sharing with me the amount of training that they do. And I was 
kind of shocked. I mean, it seems like it's train, 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 train. Do you see that in the both the big cities that you go into and the smaller, you know, county public safety areas? Do you see that that training, that commitment to training for everyone from the frontline people all the way to the tech people and the 911 operators, that commitment to training and how important is that to have a successful public safety initiative? Hugely important. And, it, and it's everything from in service training that you're required to take every year to keep up with the, the legal statutes that are out here to best practice methods and, and, and taking people on a jail or uh, taking calls on a 911 center. Um, there's the in-service training, there's the technology training. Um, you know, because when we do these projects, there's also a, a large amount of training that has to happen. And most of it happens through the process for the ones that are on the bill team. They're very indoctrinated in that process. They can go back and socialize it through the agency. But it's very in-depth. And at the same time, one of the things we try to get all our agencies to do is if Buck and Nandy are in class today for learning CAD, both pretty smart guys. But at the end of the day, on a two-day training, at some point, your hair's blown back and you're like, okay, I've taken about all I can take. So we always try to get our agencies, and we found this to be hugely successful, get your training initially, and six months later, we come back and do what's called a business process review. What are you doing well? What are you not doing at all? And then from that, the vendor comes in to do that for the agency. And now you, you know the system. You can ingest so much more. It's not you're learning how, which button to hit. Now you're, it's, it just really makes you much more fluid in the system, but it does take that extra training to do that. It's all training. So yeah, it makes sense, Buck. Of course, technology can help, but humans drive it. And the humans have to be trained and they have to put in they have to be put into into the right position to use the technology correctly to effectuate right. this this massive sort of change or sea change within a community for public safety. Now, before I let you go. Yep. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. We have younger entrepreneurs watching the show. I hope they're watching this as fascinating, you know, as I've been talking to you, Buck. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show that are maybe having a tough time, maybe they're hitting a roadblock, maybe they freeze in the frame. You know, we, we hate to see that. Um, <laughs> what can you share with entrepreneurs about what it takes to keep on pushing when they're hitting those roadblocks? Yeah, you know, uh, I say entrepreneurship is a full contact sport. And um, I was um, I've always been known to be a good forecaster. Um, that was blown out of the water when I started my, my business 10 months before COVID happened. And these deals take about a year to close. And all of a sudden, my whole pipeline dissolved in front of my face a year into my business. So what I would and I've studied entrepreneurship and leadership and business management for years. And I, 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 I'll always be a student of it and I'll never know enough. But the number one thing is don't quit. I'll tell you right now, the people that make it in this business, most of the people that are very successful in business had the same hardships you did, but they just wouldn't take no for an answer. They found a way. You hold on tight. You pray. If you pray, you do. You fight tooth and nail to keep your business. If that is your dream and that is what you want to do, trust me, many, many nights I laid in bed and couldn't sleep when I went through COVID and didn't know where I was going to get the next paid check from, I made it because I didn't give up. And that's true for most people that's done anything worthwhile. If it's worthwhile, it's not going to be easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Yeah, I love it, Buck. Of course, uh, Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank. Many people that watch the yeah. show, you know that we, we've we interviewed a number of people from, from Shark Tank that have done deals yeah. with O'Leary and, and uh, Cuban. But she says something really interesting. She says, I don't believe in committing to doing something that you like to do. She says, if you want to be successful, do something you're good at. And I love that so much. And of course, the people at National Public Safety Group, I mean, you've got a great team. Everybody's good at what they do. They're great at what they do. They're leaders, right. you're leaders. And you're changing so many public safety outcomes. It must be very rewarding waking up in the morning, knowing that even like you mentioned, that 10 second differential, if you can effectuate a change in 10 seconds in a number of cases, you've done your job because you're saving lives. So, Buck, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Dotcom Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Andy, thank you so much. It was an honor and a privilege. Thank you.